Last time we looked into the history of Ralph Bakshi, we saw how he created his 1978 adaptation of The Lord of the Rings, which would be the stepping stone for the novels to become one of, if not the biggest fantasy franchise of all time. However, we also saw that it was meant to be a part one of a big two-parter film saga. So the question remains, why is it that Ralph didn't go and finish the job in order to go and make a Return of the Kings movie? Well, that's actually the thing. You see, when making Lord of the Rings, he realized that he actually wasn't a fan of making adaptations, or at least making movies that is actually based on something. He would much rather go and tell his own story than to tell someone else's, even if it is a story that he absolutely adores like J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. So, for his next movie, he decided to go and return to his comfort zone, where he can set himself back into reality and originality with American Pop. The movie is told through four generations of musicians, whose lives also reflect on the culture of pop music during their respective era. There's Zelmi, a Russian Jewish immigrant working in a burlesque house during the turn of the century, Benny, a jazz pianist who enlists in battle in World War II, Tony, a songwriter in the hippie movement whose life slowly deteriorates by heroin, and Little Pete, a drug dealer who'd rather make music than sell coke in the rock age. After finishing up on adapting The Lord of the Rings, Ralph Bakshi wanted to return to his comfort zone by making a movie based on a personal subject. This time, he planned out to make a film that's about music, since one of his favorite pastimes is to just sit back, relax, and enjoy some tunes. With that in mind, he knew that there was one person perfect to help make his idea a reality, and that is Dan Melnick, who after getting kicked out of MGM, went to become the president of Columbia Pictures two years later. Not only was Melnick a good acquaintance of Ralph's, but he also had a talent of bringing out films that had a strong theme of music, like the That's Entertainment movies and All That Jazz. Of course, in order to make a good film about music, you need to have good music. The film does feature an original score done by Lee Holdridge, but thanks to his reputation as the master of adult animation, Ralph managed to get more than 40 popular songs for the generations represented in the film. In fact, some would be surprised by the list of artists featured, including Jimi Hendrix, Louis Prima, The Mamas and the Papas, Janis Joplin, The Doors, Lou Reed, Bob Dylan, Jefferson Airplane, and so much more. And the best of all, the licensing fees for them only cost Ralph less than $100,000, so, it was perfect for the production to have such a great soundtrack while maintaining its $2.5 million budget. Maybe it was a nightmare for Columbia when they tried to release it on home media during the 1990s, but that's not Ralph's problem. Even though the characters don't necessarily reflect upon Ralph's own life, his biggest influences for them are the people he grew up seeing in Brownsville. He wanted to present the dreamers that don't necessarily make it in life, Rather it be by destroying themselves with wrong choices, or having their lives cut short before achieving their dreams. Danke. Like he did with his previous film, Ralph wanted to have this movie be mostly depicted in rotoscope animation in order to capture the movie's realism, the emotion of the characters, and their performances when they make music. However, animating these characters would need some special hands. This is why Ralph appointed Luis Zingarelli to work on both the layouts and design of the characters, while animators like Barry Jackson, Johnny Vita, and Marsha Adams also lend their hands to visually craft the generations of musical struggles. When it was released on February 12, 1981, the film turned out to be a hit. It managed to gross $6 million at the box office, and some critics would give it some high praise by Ralph Bakshi standards, like animation historian Jerry Beck called it one of his best, and even the New York Times was amazed at the success that Mr. Bakshi had in turning animated characters into figures of real feelings. In 2008, 
Director Hype Williams paid tribute to the movie by using rotoscope animation and some of the film's backgrounds for Kanye West's music video of Heartless. While it may have been about the failures of many generations, it also made generations remember this film as one of Bakshi's hits. While Ralph was making all those movies, there was one personal project that he kept on the side for many years. One that he was determined to create, even without the support of any major studio, and that is Hey Good Lookin'. It's about Vinny, the leader of the street gang The Stompers, who hangs out with his buddy Crazy Shapiro in the streets of Brooklyn. While things may seem to look up when he reignited the flames with his old love, Rozzy, he stumbled upon his rival, Boogaloo and the Chaplains, and they organize a rumble with the Stompers. Now Vinny and Crazy have to convince their crew to prepare for the rumble and be strong for their girls. In order to fully discuss about Hey Good Lookin', we're gonna have to take a few steps back in our story to 1973, when the production of Coonskin was complete. For his next movie, Ralph wanted to take his artistic skills to the next level. He wanted to create a true live-action animation hybrid, where his animated characters feel like they are actually interacting with a real environment. Sure, Ralph may have done a bit of that in Heavy Traffic and Coonskin, but his plan was to present the entire movie that way. While that was his aim for the visuals, his goal for the story was to present his fantasized version of Brooklyn in the 1950s, where the underground is ruled by greasers who play by their own rules and fueled by their own manlyhood, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. In fact, the main characters, Vinny and Crazy Shapiro, are both modeled after two friends Ralph hanged out with during grade school. Once the script was complete, Warner Brothers decided to step in to help him out with the movie and greenlit the project under their company. The reason why they were so eager to do so was because they felt like they've made a mistake when they bailed out of Fritz the Cat, since that film went to become a major success and hoped that they'll redeem themselves with Hey Good Looking. And so in 1974, Ralph started to work on the live action segments, shooting both in the streets of New York and in one of Warner Brothers sound stages in Los Angeles for the places outside of what was supposed to obviously be Brooklyn. Like with some of his early films, Bakshi highly encouraged the actors to improvise throughout the whole feature, since he wanted to capture a more natural feeling for the actors. In fact, there was one moment where he was so pissed that he couldn't get something that felt legitimately real for them. Like, all he asked was just for the people to act like they were relaxing in the 1950s. However, when it was break time, that's when he saw his golden moment. Ironically, they were doing exactly what he wanted when they were not working. Just taking their coffee, chatting amongst themselves, even one guy was hitting on some of the girls. He knew that was his moment, so he took the camera and secretly filmed them while the actors were on break. Sure, the cinematographer quit when he heard what Ralph did, but hey, at least he got what he wanted. He even managed to get the glam punk rock band New York Dolls to come in and play a bunch of gay guys, which is actually a recurring trope in Bakshi's early works now that I think about it. Anyways, by the time that he filmed the live action segments he needed and had a bit of animation done, Ralph made a three minute promo to present at the 1975 Cannes Film Festival showing his new artistic style of filmmaking where he made a serious live action film starring cartoon characters. All seemed to be going well for the ambitious project, but then... Coonskin happened. The controversy of that film was spreading like wildfire when it hit theaters, and it got the Warners worried. Despite Good Looking being one of Ralph's least politically charged animated features, the studio began to be scared of being associated with him, and what was going to be released just a few months after Coonskin now ended up getting ultimately postponed. But it wasn't just the controversy that made them steer away from this film. They also told Ralph that the company felt like this live-action animation hybrid thing would make the movie, in their words, unreleasable. Now, Warner Brothers did not fully gave up on Hey Good Lookin' though. 
After talking with then-President Frank Wells that Bakshi didn't go completely like what his contract stated and nearly avoided a lawsuit, Ralph is now left with a highly challenging task. Basically, he needed to redo most of the movie. These big changes include having the actors redo their dialogue, scrap the idea of having real songs for the feature due to how the licensing fees would have destroyed the movie's budget, and replace the music with an original score by John Madeira, and throw out all the live action parts to turn it into a fully animated feature. With the exception of the rumble scene where the chaplain's breakdancing have been rotoscoped. Oh, and uh, did I forget to mention that Warner Brothers would no longer give him any more money for the project? This ultimately left Ralph to pretty much fund an entire movie out of his own pocket for the next seven years. At this point, any other director would have just given up on the project and move on to make another. But for Ralph, this was something very personal for him and doesn't want to see his art and his love letter to the 1950s be left abandoned. And so, during the production of his next films like Wizards, The Lord of the Rings, and American Pop, Whenever he would not be working on those films, he would set his focus onto Hey Good Lookin', while bringing a handful of his animators on the side from time to time to work on the film. It may have taken a while and Ralph had to swallow a lot of his pride to make those changes, but eventually, he did what many considered impossible and finished off Hey Good Lookin' 2.0. When the early 1980s rolled along, Warner Brothers came back to Ralph and finally agreed to release the feature, since at the time, adult animation had a rebound in popularity thanks to the success of movies like Heavy Metal and Ralph's very own American Pop. However, when it was released on October 1st, 1982, it was like if no one noticed. The film only got a limited run in New York City and in Los Angeles a few months later. It is possible that it did better in other places of the world, but for the most part, it was literally a no-show. As for the critics, they do enjoy what's been done with the animation, but without his signature social commentary, the movie doesn't have much to offer. As time would move on, however, even if Ralph himself wasn't a fan of the new version of the film, it would go on to gain a strong cult following thanks to TV airings and home video sales. It even got the approval of Quentin Tarantino himself. But rather if people were satisfied or not with how Hey Good Looking ended up becoming, that doesn't mean that Ralph's original vision is gone forever. According to Ralph himself, Warner Brothers might possibly own a completed version of the never before seen live action animation hybrid version of the film. So maybe his efforts in the mid 1970s might not go in vain after all. It may have told a story about greasers in the 1950s, but for Ralph, it was a tale of what happens when passion can leave you with more sacrifices than rewards. While he may have gotten a burnout after finishing off Hey Good Lookin', Ralph would immediately find inspiration for his next movie by reuniting with his old friend to create Fire and Ice. Set between two rivaling kingdoms, Lord Necron of Ice Peak created giant glaciers that forced humanity to go south of the equator. Meanwhile, at the other kingdom, Necron's minions were sent to demand the surrender of Jarol, the king of Firekeep, and went to kidnap the princess Tigra. Now it's up to a warrior named Lorne and a dark hooded figure named Darkwolf to save the kingdom of Firekeep and rescue the princess. Throughout the early 1980s, pop culture began to be highly interested in a particular trend, which is going into the world of fantasy where the hero is a buffed up shirtless ultra manly guy saving women in the skimpiest of clothing. It was thanks to franchises like The Beastmaster, Conan the Barbarian, and He-Man and the Masters of the Universe that really made it popular. When looking at these properties, the mind of Ralph Bakshi began coming up with ideas, thinking about how he could create his own fantasy world with a muscled up hero. However, he wouldn't do it alone. He had to call an old friend that he knew since the days of the underground comics, and that is legendary fantasy illustrator Frank Frazetta. He agreed to collaborate and everything quickly fell into place to prepare the film, including getting the $1.2 million budget from the same investors that helped him with American Pop, and get a distribution deal with 20th Century Fox, who had a great experience with Ralph when they distributed Wizards. Throughout production, 
Both Bakshi and Frazetta kept a careful eye on how the movie would visually be. From casting the right people, to getting the right movements in the live action footage, to using the right colors for the animation. The reason for this is because Ralph's goal is to have the movie look like a living Frazetta illustration, emphasizing the strong details of the realistic people that are ready for combat. This is also why he decided to have the entire film rotoscoped to capture as much of Frank's realism in the works as possible. When bringing in the actors for the live action shots, there are some that would also provide the voice of the characters they portray, while others had to be voiced by someone else. While some are more minor roles like the subhumans that were played by Stuntman in the live action references, most of them are actually main characters like Lorn, Tigra, Necron, Queen Juliana, and Tigra's tutor. For the animation team, there were plenty of Bakshi veterans that were on board with the picture like Brenda Banks, Carl Bell, John Spacey, and Steve Gordon. However, they also brought on board new guys that would later make a big name for themselves, including illustrators James Gunnery and Thomas Kincaid working on the backgrounds, and Aeon Flux creator Peter Chung, who worked as a layout artist and an animator of the dinosaurs. In fact, he was so devoted to working with Ralph and Frank that he was doing his layout job on Fire and Ice during his spare time while he was also working for Disney. When it was released on August 26, 1983, unlike the men presented in the feature, the movie was a total wimp. Because of its limited release, it barely made much money at the box office, and critics didn't care for it much because it mostly felt like a He-Man clone. However, during the time after the film came out, fans would find a newfound appreciation for the feature, thanks to the connection of Frank Frazetta. The Online Film Critics Society placed the movie at number 99 on their Top 100 Animated Features of All Time in 2003, and director Robert Rodriguez was interested in making a live-action remake in honor of Frazetta, which Sony Pictures got the film rights for at the end of 2014. Whatever happened to it? Well, considering that the deal was done at the same time as the disastrous Sony hack and the company had to make some major changes since then, I think it might have changed their minds on the plan shortly afterwards. But even without a remake, we still have the original animated film that showed the combining powers of Bakshi and Frazetta. You better learn to live with pain.